Hello, and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rohit Gosain, and here with my brother and co-host, Rahul Gosain. We are both practicing medical community oncologists, and our goal with this discussion is to keep our fellow community colleagues up to date in this ever-changing field of cancer. Today, we are kicking off our three-part CME discussion in advanced metastatic GEJ and gastric adenocarcinoma with a deeper dive in a particular space that is HER2-positive disease. To reiterate the current standard of care, we are joined by a friend and a colleague, Dr. Ritika Mehta, a GI medical oncologist from Whale Cornell. Ritika, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you both. Ritika, welcome. Let's jump right in. Though our focus today is on advanced metastatic GE junction and gastric adenocarcinoma, it would be a miss not to appreciate a recent advancement in this field. Though this was in resectable disease, we now have Dervalumab with chemotherapy in peri-op settings, followed by post-op Dervalumab and FLOT, and then continuing Dervalumab for a total of one year. This was recently approved based off overall survival benefit seen in Matterhorn study. Whereas when it comes to metastatic disease, we're making that treatment decision based off CPS score, HER2 status, and Claudin 18.2 expression. FGFR is considered important, but as if now today, we don't have any approved agents in frontline settings for this. And of course, we're eagerly waiting to see data for Horizon GEA01 study to see if Xanadatumab is going to change our current treatment landscape. But for now, let's focus on this current standard of care treatment for HER2 positive disease. Rutika, can you start us off here? How do we define HER2 positive disease and what treatment options do we have in frontline settings? Thanks, Raul, for that question. Um, so when a patient walks into the door and I see a pathology report, I'm looking at several key biomarkers, namely MMR, HER2, and PDL1. When I look at the HER2 report, I want to make sure that these are assessed by the ASCO CAP guidelines, which means the HER2 immunohistochemistry should be 3 plus, or if it's 2 plus, then it should have a reflex ish testing done, which gives an amplified ratio of more than two. Um, and that would that would be the definition for HER2 positivity. There are times when, you know, I get a bone biopsy and HER2 testing might not be reliable and patient has maybe a tissue NGS testing done or liquid biopsy, also known as circulating tumor DNA test. And sometimes these often will pick up ERBB2 amplification. So in the absence of, you know, immunohistochemistry not showing any other, you know, actionable results, I might take that into consideration but I have to say the standard yet remains to be the ASCO CAP guidelines across all major clinical trials that have been conducted. And Ritika, once you've conducted the testing, so how are you approaching the frontline setting where when you have the PDL1 score at hand, as well as HER2 positivity has been confirmed? Yeah, so um, I think when in 2021, Keynote 811 was first kind of announced and we had looked at the improvement in the overall response rate, when comparing chemo plus trastuzumab versus chemo trastuzumab and pembrolizumab, um, there was an agnostic approval for pembrolizumab as an additional treatment option in combination with chemo trastuzumab for all HER2 positives, regardless of PDL1 status. But however, more recently, we now know that the survival benefit is limited to the PDL1 positive cohort, which is why. I'm looking at both the HER2 status and the PDL1 cutoff in order to make the decision of what treatment option would be best for that patient. Um, so, for example, if the HER2 is positive and PDL1 is negative, which is CPS score of less than one, then the patient would be eligible for chemo plus trastuzumab. However, if the patient has a PDL1 cutoff of one or more, then that does become eligible for the addition of pembrolizumab to that chemo trastuzumab combination. Thanks for sharing your thoughts, Ruthika. And where you started, that is checking for these targeted mutations, whether that's HER2, MMR, PDL1, and also Claudin 18.2. Now, once you have confirmed HER2 positive disease, uh, which is about 20 to 25% of gastric cancer, and when you uh, look at GEJ adenocarcinoma, slightly higher there, 30%. Mm -hmm. And Rahul, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, Horizon GEA01 uh, study, what we've seen is the press release from Zanidatumab does look impressive, but we still have to wait for a full data there. 
there. But along with that, uh, we have TDXD data in frontline setting, which is still awaiting on the full data, but exciting to see how this all plays out. While we know that zanidatumab did get approved in November 2024 for HER2-positive disease, but that's for biliary tract cancer. But coming back to our current treatment options, Rithika, if the disease was to progress in frontline settings, are you retesting for HER2 or any of these markers? And what are you relying on from treatment option standpoint if HER2-positivity still is intact? Yeah, that's that was a question that used to come up often, and I think we now have some more clarity about that. Um, so historically speaking, in my practice, I always retested my patients for HER2 uh, expression. So if they progressed on a trastuzumab-based regimen, they all would get uh, a biopsy unless and until there was a clinical indication to not biopsy that individual. Um, and if they're positive, then I would offer them a HER-directed therapy. And TDXD had initially become FDA approved, you know, a few years ago, um, based on the Destiny Gastric-01 and Gastric-02 studies. Now, interestingly, more recently, Destiny Gastric-04 study was presented, and that is a randomized phase three study looking at TDXD versus ramisumab and Pactitaxel in the second line setting. And deliberately, the study design included that there should be retesting of HER2 upon progression. And if they were HER2 positive, then they would be randomized. Um, and that did show that an improvement in overall survival with TDXD as compared to ramisumab and Paclitaxel. So I feel there is definitely value in retesting. And now more with the Destiny Gastric-04 study, I think you definitely should retest individuals for HER2 expression. Um, there have been several studies to show that there is loss of HER2 expression over time, and that could be anywhere from 15 to 20%, especially those that are 2 plus and ish positive tend to lose their HER2, HER2 positivity more often than those who are expressing 3 plus. Ritika, can I push a little more on this? What if it was HER2 positive in frontline settings, they got trastuzumab, and now when you're testing, it's HER2 negative, or 2 plus and FISH negative. As a general community oncologist treating breast cancer, our often paradigm ends up being if it's HER2 positive, we continue with that backbone. Sure. Are we missing out on some of these patients benefiting from that anti-HER2 therapy? Because as you said, yes, there's HER2 loss, but that tumor heterogeneity is also important that we have to keep in mind. And especially when tying into the breast cancer world, we will continue on confusing. with that. That is true. Um, so there have been several studies to show that HER2 expression between breast versus gastric is very different. So you do find that pockets of high expressing HER2 positive cells and pockets of HER2 negative cells in gastric cancer specimens. If you take two biopsies adjoining to each other, you might find totally different HER2 expression levels. I usually say if you have a good surgical biopsy um, and if you look at how many cells are HER2 positive, that typically tells you if that is a floridly HER2 positive tumor versus if you say if the pathologist has written it's five to 10 cells, then probably it's not extremely HER2 positive and you might not be missing out on any opportunity to treat this patient with an anti-HER2 therapy. Um, there has been a push to learn about more of these HER2 low tumors in gastric cancers as well. But I think um, just based on TDXD data that we had from Destiny Gastric 01, there wasn't a lot of overall response rate in the HER2 low population. So as of this time, the HER2 low is treated as HER2 negative for all intents and purposes in gastric cancer. Absolutely. And again, once we have all these treatment options available, trastuzumab, TDXD, zanidatumab, it will all come down to sequencing and managing those side effects. And you know, while we're talking about TDXD as a general medical oncologist, when treating breast cancer or lung cancer, the approved dose for TDXD is 5.4 milligrams per kilogram. And that's for all the other solid malignancies, except for gastric and G-junction adenocarcinoma, where the approved dose is 6.4 milligrams per kilogram. And I know like these drugs are used heavily now in our clinic, but we have to keep nausea, alopecia, fatigue, and of course, ILD in mind because there's mortality associated with this. Yes, this is an active drug, but it still has its fair share of side effects. And again, on our end, we'll get a chance to focus on side effects in our next discussion. But coming back to sequencing, Rutka, 
what if the disease was to progress or we run into side effects where rechallenging with more T uh, TDXD is not an option. Here in that second, third line outside HER2, are you doing NGS testing again? What options do we have here? Um, so my practice is where I do serial CT DNAs on patients. Um, so I tend to pick up some, ex, you know, different mutations, which could put, make them eligible for clinical trials or maybe off-label treatment options. Having said that, I think there is an unmet need for a third-line treatment option in gastric cancer um, since we are front-loading most of our biomarker-driven therapies in the first-line setting. Um, having said that, now, as you mentioned, zanitimab is going to be FDA, might be FDA approved, we don't know. Um, they have announced some you know, positive, exciting uh, top-line results, so we'll see. Um, but if that does become approved, then which, which agent are you going to be using first line? Then what kind of remains to use as second line and third line setting? In addition to Zani, TDXD is being looked at in the first line setting in two major phase three clinical trials. So again, um, there is, there's more and more opportunities in the first line setting, but the, the question about how to sequence in second and third line will become a huge unmet need in the near future. Exciting times indeed, but again, uh, one cannot forget the side effect profile, especially when TDXD has some chemotherapy-related side effects, as Rahul mentioned. Ruthika, when Rahul was talking about 6.4 mix per keg for TDXD and elsewhere it's 5.4, what is your treatment paradigm like? Uh, do you rely on 6.4 and then dose reduce if you see any complications or uh, treatment-related side effects? Yeah, so I think <clears throat> this is the difference between clinical trials versus real life population. Right. Our real life patients are nearly not as close to what a robust patient on a clinical trial would be. Um, if I have a very young individual with ECOG performance status of zero, by all means, I would definitely try the 6.4 milligram per kilogram dose level. Um, but for my older frail patients, I tend to go more with the 5.4. Um, that's that's what I've been comfortable, even across other GI disease types, such as colon and biliary tract, um, 5.4 is the approved dose. So I, I tend to tend to be a little bit more cautious, especially in the old frail patients. And if they have lung metastases, I'm definitely a lot more cautious that way. Indeed, one has to acknowledge that treatment is palliative in nature here. So looking out for those treatment options that's better tolerated is extremely critical. All right, before we close, Ruthika, uh, from GI ASCO 2026, which is right upon us, any final thoughts from the discussion today or studies that you're eagerly looking out for? Um, <clears throat> there's definitely the ARCUS study that we're all hoping to hear about. Um, there's also, as you mentioned, the Horizon GEA data. Hopefully, again, we don't have the abstract titles released yet, so we don't know what's going to be presented. But hopefully in the near future, if not at GI ASCO, then maybe in the subsequent Congresses. We're looking forward to how this all plays out. Ruthika, thank you so much for touching on the current treatment landscape. From new approvals starting out with Durvalumab in earlier line settings to newer data coming to us that is anidatumab or TDXD in frontline settings is ex extremely exciting. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap from today's discussion. For our listeners, just to quickly recap this first episode with Dr. Ruthika Mehta, we touched on the current treatment landscape for HER2 positive advanced or metastatic GEJ or gastric adenocarcinoma, where upfront biomarker testing and NGS testing is extremely critical. So you're looking for HER2, PDL1, MMR, and also Claudin 18.2. For HER2 positive disease, as of now, we rely on trastuzumab, and then at the time of progressive disease, we have TDXD. Rohit, we also touched on the role of immunotherapy here with anti HER2 therapy if it is PDL1 positive disease. We very well might see new drugs such as zanidatumab in this space, depending on the final data from Horizon study and TDXD in earlier lines as we wait for full data to be presented. It will all come down to efficacy, sequencing, and managing side effects in metastatic settings, especially when we know that the treatment is with palliative intent. Indeed, sir. This takes us to the next episode in this series where we focus on side effects from our available treatment options, and that's being covered by Dr. Jeffrey Koo and Dr. Shruti Patel. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay tuned for more discussions around treatment algorithms, FDA approvals, and conference highlights. We are the Oncology Brothers.